Hello there, welcome back to the booth here at Pro Tour 25th anniversary. That's Simon Gertz and I'm Marshall Cycliff. Thanks so much for coming along for live coverage of our team tournament here from Minneapolis. We have one more round to go here in day number one. And boy, we've got two undefeated teams left. There's only three left in the whole field. And the other one actually has a draw on their record. So we have the last two perfect records left in the field. We've got Josh Hutter Layton, Ben Stark, and Martin Yuza from Team Channel Fireball. And they are going to be facing down Jonathan Sukanik, Jacob Nagro, and Hunter Cochran on the other side of the table. We're going to start things a little different. We're going to start with modern this time. We've been kind of on the legacy because we don't get to see it that often. But today it's going to be modern. We've got... This new Vengevine deck, this Graveyard Vengevine deck, facing down Kark Clan Ironworks. You're not going to want to go anywhere. This one could be quick. Let's head on down. It's time for round number seven here from Minneapolis. Hello and welcome back to coverage here at Pro Tour 25th anniversary. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Simon Gertzen. And it is all down to this, Simon. Day number one is coming to its conclusion. Round seven. We're playing seven rounds today, seven rounds tomorrow. And one of the two teams that you see in the feature match area here will be undefeated heading in to the second day of competition. And boy, what a leg up they're going to have with the probable X and three record needed to make it into the top four. Being seven and oh with only seven rounds to go is going to be a huge advantage. We've got in our feature match area, Ben Stark from Team Channel Fireball. He is playing Ironworks combo representing modern for his team here. And then on the other side of the table, boy, Jacob Nagro has brought well, the new kid on the block in modern, shall we say, Black Red Vengevine. Can you give us a, a taste of what we might see here from Jacob? Yeah, super, super quick intro to this deck. It's um, a little bit like Hollow One that it puts blood gas into the graveyard. Um, bridges from below are being used to generate zombies with a greater Gargadon and a bunch of cheap zombies. And then the, the best part about it is you have Vengevines and you have seven or eight copies of Hangerback Walkers and Walking Ballista, which are mostly cast for zero mana to trigger a Bridge from Below and Vengevine. Looks like we're perhaps on the wrong table here, but we'll just start things off with our legacy, and then if we can get it switched over, we will do so as well. Oh, right when I spoke up, it exactly happened. Boom! Two Bridge from Belows in the graveyard right off the bat here. It looks like Simon... Yeah, we almost missed the match. Uh, uh, yes, we might we, we might have missed it all there. <laughs> no, uh, of course the the bridges on their own are not um, that scary. One of the few cards in Magic that only do something when they are in your graveyard. But when they are, um, and especially when you're playing against a deck without creatures, you can just generate a ton of zombies. Yeah, now Ben Stark does have a few creatures in his list, and they actually are kind of interested in going to the graveyard but they're not the kind of thing that he can just do on command. Most cards in the uh, Ironworks deck are actually interested in going to the graveyard. That's right. Because that's how you generate your value. And uh, one thing I wanted to mention, it's more like a general observation, but the I think the times of Dredge are over where you rely on your graveyard to be full and producing value turn after turn. We are seeing decks that only need the graveyard for one or two turns, and then they've generated so much advantage that even a rest in peace doesn't matter anymore. And we, we actually saw that uh, previously. Turn to rest in peace, not enough to stop the wrench deck. That's right. Gravecrawler, another card that can come back as long as you control another zombie. And this deck actually has multiple ways to uh, get zombies onto the battlefield. In this case, it was Insolent Neonate being sacrificed to its own ability, triggering two different copies of Bridge from Below and putting six power out on turn two for Jacob. He's passed the turn, uh, has Ben Stark, and now Jacob gets to cleanly attack for six. But, oh boy, he's already in the tank for some reason. What's going on here? Well, there, there are actually whacking? two Bushwreckers in his hand. Uh, if he has two red mana, I'm sure he's going for it. What, what, what is the reason not to? Oh, he has he has more cards, of course. If he has a um, a greater Gargadon, that would also be super powerful because you can sacrifice Gravecrawler and then recast it from the graveyard, uh, triggering the bridges, of course. Mm. Really nice combo with the with the Vengevine in the graveyard. Uh, I think Nago drew that after the Faithless looting, probably. He does have his third land here. 
and he's going to uh, flash back Faithless Looting, choosing to potentially set himself up for future turns rather than trying to add his maximum to the board right now. We're going to see a Vengevine and a land hit the board, but he still gets the crunch for six. Marshall, he, down to he wasn't thinking about what to do this turn. Hmm. He was mapping out how many turns he needs to win the game. He was just uh -huh. counting up to 20 and figuring out which line would give him the fastest kill. W what is the earliest turn that Stark can go off under... <sighs> Any in a normal circumstances. Yeah, let's not go like for this super crazy multiple mocks uh, draws right. because that's super unrealistic. But, uh huh. Um, I think if you if you start with uh, one mox opal, and you have Dark Sea Citadel power out maybe with a Mind Stone, the the earliest clock and arrowworks that you can, there is I think a theoretical chance to win on turn three okay but four is kind of where this deck is aiming if uninterrupted yeah okay. and, and four is not is definitely uh, very reasonable okay he does he did just get a Krok clan ironworks off of ancient stirrings though he's got to be worried about dying next turn now there's now a vengevine vine in the battle uh, excuse me in the graveyard so, so nice scary stuff nagra already did the math and we can do the same bushwrecker bushwrecker kicked get wrench vine back Trigger resolves, everybody plus one plus zero, and haste. And suddenly we have, uh, I think, 16 damage. It's definitely a lethal attack uh, waiting there for Stark. He has no defense whatsoever. Being a pure combo deck, the Ironworks... Uh, deck doesn't really have interaction in any meaningful way. You see a couple copies of Pyrite Spellbomb, which, uh, you know, double as a win condition. And sure, they can be used to kill something on the other side, but not a lot. No, and, and even even looking at uh, the sideboards, the KCI deck is made to be as proactive as possible. So um, you're not trying to... You're trying to stop your opponent from keeping you from comboing off. You're not That's right. really interacting with it. Now, combo. Th there is another piece of interaction. You see one on the battlefield here, an engineered explosives for Ben Stark, and that will allow him to take care of both of those zombie tokens, which does take care of, what, six damage mm -hmm. on this board minimum, thanks to those goblin bushwhackers. And I think that that means Ben can actually stay alive here. He can. He will lose his Mox Opal, though. Ah, that is annoying. Now he might have another one in his hand, in which case it's not nearly as painful. But it doesn't look like he does at this point. All right, so there we go. It was actually insolent. Neonate into Kicked Bushwhacker, trigger the Vengevine, it comes back. That's on cast, so that trigger resolves. Then you can have the Bushwhacker trigger resolve as well. And there we see the engineered explosives clean up the board, but it's still a ton of damage here. Yeah, N Nagro correctly just forcing the, the explosives it was to be sacrificed. Is he knocking him down to two? Yeah, he is. So two life. This is a turn. Ben Stark needs to go off here. Realistically, under any other scenario, he's just dead. Does he have a scrap trawler to go with the ironworks? He might get there. Well, there's the ironworks. This could be really close. Sacrifice... An Icar Wellspring, get two mana, draw a card. Can you do anything else, Ben? He's already played his land for the turn. Terrarian? Sacrifice it. Plus one, plus one mana, plus a card. That's a star. Same thing. He needs to generate a bit more mana. Does he have a, he doesn't have a Citadel. Citadel would be amazing here. Mirror Retriever, I believe. Might also be able to do it with Mirror Retriever. <laughs> well, he doesn't have a choice but to go for it here. He is facing lethal damage in multiple ways and doesn't really have the resources to take care of it. I think, I think the, scrap trawler. the key piece is actually the Mox Opal in the graveyard. He will he get, get it back, back. and it, it generates three mana every time you, you recycle it. So he's going to sacrifice... Is he going to actually be able to go off here, Simon? He just got back the Mox Opal. I think it's almost deterministic at this point because he has the Mirror Retriever already. That's that's just so much value generated by, generated by Scrap Trawler. I mean, that is the combo, right? He just needs a way to draw a card repeatedly? There's a there's a Chromatic Star, so he gets that back. Sure. Um, 
Oh, man. Jacob Nagro had a very good draw here, and it seems as if Ben may be able to just bypass it. He's getting back two cards thanks to Retriever plus the, stra the Scrap Trawler trigger. Replays the Wellspring and says, I got it. I've got the pieces to do this repeatedly. Generate mana and draw cards. Yeah, once you have the second Scrap Trawler, it's actually an infinite loop with the, with the Mirror Retrievers. With the one Mirror Retriever. Nagro says... You can trust me. If you can see it, I'll show you what I have in my hand. That's fine. Yes. Okay. No, it's fine. We agreed on it. Okay. So you heard what happened there. It, it's a little interesting because Jacob did have some... He, he needed to know what it was that Ben was actually going to kill him with, even though Ben basically demonstrated that he could go through his entire deck. And they asked the judge, which is what you should do, hey, can I just show him my win condition? But the judge is like, well, look, you got to play. Like, you can't. Th there's no rule that says you can just sift through your library and just start peeling cards out of it. Like, you have to go through those Which lines. is a, go a good rule, I would say. Dang right it is. I wouldn't say, yeah, go for it. Just start, you know, <laughs> going through your library. But at the same time, Jacob and Ben both know that why do we need to sit here and watch him do every interaction? So Ben just said, look, Jacob, I'm a Hall of Famer. We're on camera. You can trust me. And I'm going to show you the way that I'm going to win the game. And it's going to be a pirate spell bomb. And Jacob said, no problem, okay. Then after the concession, well, Ben can show him whatever he wants, and that's exactly what he did. All right, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, though, more round seven here from Pro Tour 25th anniversary. We'll be back right, right back after this. Up your game with Ultra Pro Magic the Gathering accessories. Find the best magic art on card sleeves, deck boxes, play mats, and more. Visit ultrapro.com to learn more and find a retailer near you. Welcome back to the feature match area here in Minneapolis. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe with Simon Gertz, and we're in round number seven. This is the last round of Swiss here for the Pro Tour today. We will have Silver Showcase coverage for you of the quarterfinals coming up after this, so don't go anywhere when we're done. But for now, we're dialed in on the team event. $850,000 in prize money going out uh, for the Pro Tour here, and... Uh, Boy, these teams have come prepared, and we've got two undefeated teams in the feature match here. There's only one other, but so far, today has belonged to this team from Channel Fireball, Josh Utter-Layton, Ben Stark, and Martin Yuza. And look at that 
like not only the leaderboard being 6 and 0 in their favor, but look at the game count. Mm -hmm. Win 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 across the board for them. They have been crushing this tournament thus far. Three very methodical players, always well prepared. Uh, a lot of respect, of course, for um, Yuza, who I know from y years back, uh, always a, a fearsome opponent at European GPs, or any GPs, really. You wouldn't know it meeting him. No, oh, he's a really he's nice, nice guy. He's such a nice dude, yeah. You just think, like, oh, that guy's cool, I like him. And then he sits down and just dismantles you, and you're like, oh, wait, I thought you were nice. And he's like, hey, you want to go get some food? He's, he's still nice. <laughs> I know. It's like, how do you have both? But that's just how he is. Um, we're currently watching Hunter Cochran play against Martin here on our standard table. So you can see that this is red-black for both players. There's been a lot of red-black aggro for uh, the choices for standard for our teams. Uh-oh, is this a missed land drop perhaps from Hunter? Yes, and, and uh, Cochran had a, must have had a pretty bad game one already, uh, losing so quickly in the mirror match. Right, that did go very quickly. That's yeah. also nice by user not exposing uh, something like a, uh, a Phoenix or a Chandra to a potential removal spell by Cochran, but just saying, here's another uh, scrounger, you're under so much pressure, you have to show me something. He's going to miss another land drop and only play a Scrap Heap Scrounger of his own, which, as we know, is completely terrible in a situation like this. Unable to block, and the damage is going to start piling on for Martin Yuza. This match is almost over. Uh, if Martin plays a big spell here and Hunter misses his land drop, we're done. We may well be done, even if that doesn't happen. And there's the big spell here for Martin Yuza. Chandra Torch of Defiance is going to knock... Hunter down to 17, then he's going to take an additional 6 damage, excuse me, down to 15, and now down to 9. And if he misses his land here, it's over, and even if he doesn't, it might be. Yeah, and when uh, when your opponent is spending Chandra's defeat on a Soul Scar Mage, plusing Chandra attacking with everything in the face of a Scrap Heap Scrounger, you know things are not going great. Right. Hunter with, as you might imagine, quite a strong hand, a pair of Chain Whirlers, a Chandra, Rekindling Phoenix, and a couple of Chandra's defeats from his sideboard. But that's what happens when you don't have enough mana. He's going to use Chandra's defeat, and he even gets to use the ability here, doesn't he? Yep. Yeah. see if he rem remembers. He does. Going to get rid of one of his expensive spells again, just trying to make sure he keeps hitting his land drops. But the real question is, is it just simply too late here for Hunter Cochran? He's got another copy of Chandra's Defeat to kill PNLR and reduce it down to just four damage. Now, if Martin was to just draw a bunch of lands, he says, oh, I've got this, though, and that's going to be the game. Martin Yuza secures the first match win for this round for Team Channel Fireball and said, looks across at his teammates and says, how are you guys doing? And they said, I'm up a game. The other one goes, I'm up a game. We are now one game away on either of these matches from this team being a cool 7-0 and and sleeping real nice tonight. I, I do actually have a, a trivia question because we did mention, of course, that we have three Hall of Famers sitting there. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of Hall of Famers uh, at this tournament, but three Hall of Famers in the same team? I don't think that's going to be so uh, often the case because no. I, I can think of a lot of teams that have two Hall of Famers, but not yes. three. And there are a few that have three, but this is a rarity to be sure. Yeah, the other half of Team Channel Fireball doesn't even have that. Mike Sigrist. That's right. <laughs> they had a rough day today as well. Yeah, that's why I'm, they're not uh, six and zero. Oh, that's, that's why. <laughs> wow. Uh, by by the way, um, brutal. Sukanik, Jonathan Sukanik on his Grixis Delva is very impressive play by him. Agreed. Uh, last round, he earned that jelly bean. And we're going to get a chance now to see a little bit of Legacy. We saw Blue Black Shadow in the hands of Josh Hutter Layton a bit earlier today and Grixis Delver for Jonathan also a bit earlier today. Both of them playing very well. And uh, we see Wasteland, one of the signature cards for Legacy, takes care of that Underground Sea. The follow-up play, though, is, oh, a Volcanic Island. And once again... Josh has the wasteland, and 
what is that? A third of the total mana producing uh, colored mana producing lands here for Sukenic in the in the yard. I was going to mention that seven uh, mana producing lands means that <laughs> Sukenic might just be locked here. He might just be locked out of the game. One little hope you have actually in this kind of in these kind of spots, uh, if the situation was a little bit different, is that. Uh, Josh tries to counter or interact with your brainstorm in some way, and then you daze it, saving your land from right. uh, from wasteland. Uh, so Kenneth could have actually dazed his own brainstorm mm. just to save that land. Ultimately, found a fetch land though. Otherwise, he would have been out of the game. He's also going to play ponder, probably still just scrapping to try to keep his mana base intact. And I was right. <laughs> we hear Jonathan say, all I'm trying to do is hit my land drops. And of course, you know, it is worth noting here that while Josh, it feels like he's being proactive by being the one who's doing the waste landing, you know, he hasn't done anything on his side either. Yeah, I was I was actually looking at that advantage bar, and then you see a player with two wastelands in the graveyard, nothing else. But it, it is a sizable advantage. It is. You, um, because you're the one that's deciding what's what's happening on the on the battlefield or what's not happening on the battlefield. He's going to go ahead and shuffle away those after a ponder. Didn't find the land drops he wanted. Josh. Josh likes shuffling. Ben does not. Death Shadow off the top. But are there more lands here for Josh? Yeah, he has at least one color uh, yeah. mana producing land. Okay. Colored mana producing land. That's right. It's Misty Rainforest. Four. That's right. Watery Grave. Your eyes do not deceive you. We are in Legacy. But since Death Shadow is such a key part of this deck, they're running Watery Grave. Yeah, Death Shadow uh, picking up some steam in, in Legacy. Quite unusual to see Watery Grave and, and the other uh, Ravnica lands, but here they are perfect for the job. So Kenny with a clutch draw. That underground sea there? Or? Yeah. Yeah. And he's going to be proactive now and say, Josh, I want to get a little look at your hand here. He's going to fire off Inquisition of Kozilek. And he's going to see a hand with a lot of redundancy there, Simon. You see the two copies of Death Shadow, the two copies of Brainstorm. He's also got him to Turok sitting there. I would be most scared of him to Turok. I don't think you can deny your opponent the, the extra cards when they have double Brainstorm. And th there are two ways to approach this hand. You can say, I can worry about Death Shadow later because it's definitely not coming down very soon. Alternatively, you can also say, I need to deal with every single Death Shadow to win this matchup. Mm. By the way, um, of note here, Simon, he actually, uh, Sukenic actually used Day's last turn to pick up that underground mm. seed. I thought he drew another one, but he must have shuffled his cards. Uh, yeah, I really think he quickly. just shuffled them very quickly. Yeah, he, wanted it, he used it on, I believe, that Delver and now got to replay it. Here's Brainstorm. That is Josh Utterlayton's favorite artwork right there. In fact, he had a token made of him once, and he had his face transposed onto that Brainstorm artwork. Would have been shocking to see him use anything other than that. And boy, this, uh, this Underground Sea is getting a workout. Yeah. Three land drops out of the same land. Yep. And days goes both directions here, right? You know, sometimes you see wasteland you, wasteland you to make my days better. But if you're the one doing the wastelanding, you are also, also more susceptible to days. And we've seen Sukenic be the one to take advantage of that. Jonathan just seems so comfortable with this deck. Let's see if he's got another days. He's got a response, but it looks like it's a brainstorm rather than the days. And this card can be very problematic, Ermog Angler. He's got a lightning bolt in his hand. It doesn't do anything. Now, he did find a force of will. You kind of have to use it, don't you? Absolutely. What are you going to do? Uh, you, you can't lightning bolt it. Uh, your true name nemesis is so far away and can also get countered. And Adelaide 
probably needs a force uh, of its own. It's it's a it's a risk you have to take. There there might be a days, but that's if that's the case, then uh, right. that's how it is. And you hear him, by the way, consulting with his teammates now. Ooh, he's going to exile a true name nemesis to the Force of Will. Stuck on, stuck on one land. Two, yeah. He does uh, have another land already in the graveyard. Yeah, that's true. He's got a Misty Rainforest in his hand uh, and another true name nemesis that he had hidden on top of the library anyway. And he's got a Delver of Secrets. So once again, Jonathan Sukenik navigating this game beautifully. Though I do think this is the part of the game where Josh just gets to keep going big threat, big threat, big threat, at least at some point. There's also the, the really interesting part of how much damage do you want to deal to the Death Shadow player. Sure. We know from Modern that the best way to beat a Death Shadow player is to attack for a lot of damage in a single turn, mm -hmm. rather than chipping away for two or three. And the Delver deck, that's actually how it wins, chipping <laughs> away for three and three and yeah. three. And for example, Josh does have a copy of Death Shadow in his hand, and one of them was taken taken casting. by the Inquisition. Mm -hmm. So that shows you how much Sukunik re respects the Death Shadow. Even a card like Home to Tarek, which is a straight up two for one, uh, was not as scary as a Death Shadow. So Josh is going to play it safe here go for Fatal Push on the Delver before it even gets a chance to get rolling. It's it's super interesting to me how we saw Sukunik with Grixis Delver play against Teamer Delver, and he was playing the control game because he knew his threats were better. And here you see the opposite. Death Shadow is such a supreme threat that Adelaiden can play the control game and know that his Death Shadow will ultimately win. Super interesting here as well because the fact that they're talking I bet you Ben Stark has realized that it's probably a card like Spell Pierce yeah. that they could be facing down. And Jonathan does not want to use his fetch land here, it looks like, to cast his Spell Pierce. So he's just going to let that happen. I'm going to be very careful with my phrasing here, but I'm not sure if Sukunik is actually getting a lot of help by his teammates communicating with him. You were very impressed with how he played a couple of rounds ago when we had him in the feature. I have, and I, I've lost a little bit of that feeling of flow and confidence uh, that, that he was that he was uh, demonstrating earlier. Okay. Hey, th there are definitely a, a group of players that will play uh, worse when getting, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen, as they call it. And you're leaking information to Yuza yeah. and, and Stark who are just watching you, trying to read what you are... Uh, uh, what you're exposing. So what did Josh actually get his life total down to here? Assuming he's not at 12. It, it would surprise me if Josh allows this exchange. Trade it, that's, at least in modern, that's a, not a play you would make. No. Allowing your death shadow to be lightning bolted. What you want to have, you want to be on huh. 10 or 11 and had then have a Street Wraith. Right. Y you want to try to protect that, generally speaking, and he left it available. I'm surprised. Maybe Adelaide has a as a reanimate. That, that would make a lot of sense. Oh, sure. There's a him to Turok. Spell Pierce to take care of that. Pass the turn back. And Sukenik, there we go. Land off the top of the library means true name nemesis is online, and that is the best creature in the matchup. And Sukunik knows what he got away with there. He needed to hit that land. He, he he bolted a Death Shadow. He spell pierced him, <laughs> even though the spell pierce was kind of open. Then he resolved a true name nemesis. He even has a wasteland in play. He's got to be happy, and he needs it too. Because if you look at our game count down below, Yuzu's already won his match. And nobody on Sukenik's side of the table has yet to take a game off of our trio of Hall of Famers here. Josh with a wry smile. 
But Sukenik once again just seems to really have a knack for navigating these games. And when the dust settles, he's the one who's ahead. He has a Delver. He has a true name nemesis. He's got two cards in hand. You have none. He he was uh, falling quite far behind there. Mm. But um, Josh gave him an opening, and he just had the right cards at the right moment. Playing off the top almost, but uh, that's just uh, what you have to play for. And then it's, it's absolutely correct to just play it as aggressively as possible. Just uh, test your opponent there. That is Martin Yuza back in the shadows right behind Ben Stark. Though, as we've seen them chat with each other, they haven't... Was that the uh, reanimate? It was. Okay, okay. Maybe give Jonathan a little bit of pause here about whether he can actually race at this point. But yeah, they've been basically leaving Josh alone as far as actually stepping in. Uh, which I think is absolutely correct. Josh is such a... I don't even... I, not, it's not about experience. It's, it's just the way he plays. He is just looking so far ahead that you don't need to talk uh, about what's happening on the board. He, he, when he's smiling, he's thinking about things that we haven't even uh, seen yet. Exactly. Here's Bitter Blossom now for Jonathan Sukenik. And you got to feel like it's going to be hard for Josh to win this game from this point. Jonathan has a nearly unbeatable true name nemesis down on the ground to block or start attacking when he feels it needed. And then he could just sit back and generate huge advantage from this Bitter Blossom without even spending another mana. Bitter Blossom in combination with true name nemesis, uh, that is almost unbeatable, even for, for Death Shadow, because one huge threat is not going to do it. Delver is going to be dominated very soon. You know, you know how you can beat Bitter Blossom, though. Hmm. You wait until it kills yeah. the controller. It's true. If you can, if you can apply pressure to them, it does help you win a race. But boy, it is tough to get through those fairy tokens. Josh yeah. has one window to do so with this Delver of Secrets. It's been transformed, so Insectal Aberration does get in. But now there's two fairy rogues on the other side. And that Josh, attack looks a lot worse. Yeah, Josh needs at least a second uh, Death Shadow. Maybe maybe a Gurmank Angler. He drew him to Turok, but as we can see, he's down to just one Watery Grave left on the battlefield after that Wasteland from Jonathan. And Jonathan just seems to be able to... He's in that luxurious position where he can just sit. Like, he, he could skip his draw steps and still just be ahead on the battlefield. That's what a great place to be. Especially when you consider that he does not have to skip his draw steps. And Boy, he, and his draws have been nice, too. He actually enabled, with that Bitter Blossom, he enabled that line of being able to win in, for example, two attack steps. So he's only exposing himself to Death Shadow for a single turn, if possible. Maybe even, maybe even no turn at all. Ponder is going to be the play for Sukenic, leaving himself with Daze and Force of Will left in hand. I believe I saw a brainstorm, and if that... No, uh, I saw a brainstorm. I saw a, um, a wasteland. I think there might be two. <laughs> Is that possible? Just just waste the watery grave and then... Uh, Play another wasteland and say, go? Uh, uh. And then you can start attacking, because your, your true name nemesis is not getting killed in game one. I got my approval, so I'm allowed. Oh, this is not game one. This is game two. That's true. He does have Bitter Blossom in the main, but... But this means that... Even if um, Josh brought in um, ways to deal with true name nemesis, the the one one tokens are still going to to dominate the sport. And, and additional to that, a lot of the ways that people bring in to deal with true name nemesis uh, that one one tokens mess with, you know, cards like Diabolic Edict and things like that. Yeah, this one looks like it's fully slipped away from Josh here. He's now on no lands on the battlefield. He does have a Death Shadow and an Insectal Aberration, but he's facing down simply better cards at both positions. A Bitter Blossom that's going to eventually overwhelm the Insectal Aberration and the True Name Nemesis, which can block the Death Shadow, ind shadow indefinitely. And when he decides, just attack right past it. He does have a single Engineate Explosive. Okay. That could help. Liliana would be good. Probably, it's probably too late now. Would have been good earlier. 
uh, Liliana the last hope, of course. Oh, and you can see Sukenik is feeling confident here. As well he should. Now he's going to start attacking, and in just a few short turns, he's going to even things up against Josh Hutter Layton. Josh finds a brainstorm, but that might be too little too late. His lack of land's really hurting him here. Of course, it was a forced lack of lands, but it works. You can see Martin's taking a more relaxed pose behind uh, behind Ben there. Ben's still into it. <laughs> That's because Ben is the modern player, so he's closer to legacy. When you're the standard player, you have nothing to say. <laughs> and there's another day's getting value for Jonathan. Joshua Layton down to seven, so Jonathan can attack again for three. And then an attack with that plus any other damage is game. Josh is going to attack with Death Shadow. That's going to prompt a chump block from Jonathan, who's going to fall down to eight thanks to Bitter Blossom. Draw that second wasteland that he put back with the brainstorm. Immediately take down. The underground sea attack for three more, and yeah, we've got one more turn, and this thing's done. And that's the confidence I like, you know, just reveal that wasteland off the top. I love it. And this is Josh Hutter Layton putting that sexual aberration back on the other side because he's conceding this game, and that means that we're all evened up here on table A, that is our legacy table. <coughs> but I got to say, even though that was a really nice win, for Jonathan, very impressive play uh, over a very tough player. That isn't the match for him. <laughs> and on top of it, that is the first game win. The first game win for him and his teammates. And they're already down a match. But it, it has to start with the first game win. It does indeed. One step at a time for these guys looking to knock off this powerhouse team of Hall of Famers uh, from Team Channel Fireball and remain undefeated. No matter what, they're going to be able to look back and be proud of the day that they've put together. But boy, this last match, these teams really want this last one. Go home tonight, eat some dinner, and sleep well, knowing that they put in a great day of work, and they can come back tomorrow and he even have not a not a fantastic day and still make the top four potentially. It's still quite baffling how how Stark uh, stole this game. This is really funny. <laughs> Nagro once again is going off here on turn one. He uses Insolent Neonate to discard Bridge. Bridge triggers, gets him a 2-2. Then he casts Walking Ballista and Hangerback Walker for zero each. They immediately die. Trigger the bridge. Turn one, six power, your move. <laughs> Unbelievable. What does Nagro have now? Aaron Mesa cracked. Boy, this deck is explosive, Simon. We've seen this kind of a few too many. Like, isn't it supposed to have draws where it doesn't do anything? Is that not part of the deal? It, it feels <laughs> a little bit like Hollow One with less randomness. Yes. Right? I don't know if it, if it always like this, but um, there are enough moving pieces to this that you will usually have something that works similar, and, and this Bushwrecker, every time you draw a Bushwrecker in this deck, it's just so good. Yeah, ends the game a lot of the time. It's gonna be Bloodgast as the follow-up. Ben Stark somehow, some way overcame a very good draw from Jacob Nagro and went off in the first game, but it felt like he wasn't gonna get there until he did, but boy, how is he gonna beat six power on turn one? On the play, too. Only with the turn three win, I think. Or some some way to survive. Uh, engineered explosives come to mind. That's right. That is actually what bought him the one additional turn he needed in game number one. So perhaps he could find something like that again. <laughs> For now, though, it's Inventor's Fair. Go. Combat 2468. 
Knock you down to six. Gravecrawler goes. So he's got lethal on the battlefield, even through a blocker. And now it's on Ben Stark. He's got to win this turn or sweep away some of these zombies or we're done here. I don't see a clock around Ironworks in his hand. And that is a piece you definitely need. All the scrap drawers in the world don't do much if you cannot sacrifice your artifacts. Sacrifices Terrarian to make red and green, finds ancient stirrings. Red mana floating still for Stark. What can he even do, though, if this is what he's spending his mana on? Because if he doesn't have the ironworks, then the rest of the stuff just doesn't happen. Marshall, I think the most valuable thing is he can <sighs> pretend that there is still something yeah. so that uh, Nigra doesn't know he's just cold to this. But in fact, he was shivering cold, and Ben Stark just picks up his cards. Two very good draws from Nagro. He was able to overcome one, but definitely not that one. Jacob ran him over with that bridge from below hitting the graveyard. And then the two dead creatures immediately. And he evens things up. So, fighting back. Remember, this thing started with Martin Yuzu winning his match, then Ben Stark winning his first game, and Josh winning his first game, and it looked like it was just about over. But as you said, it's one step at a time. And we saw Jonathan win his game, and now Jacob's won his game, and now they're looking at each other like, okay, let's just each win our games, and we'll be the undefeated team heading into day number two, not these guys. Yeah, the, the quick match win of, of Yuza is, is super valuable, of course. He uh, actually had a really easy time despite playing a mirror match. The draws uh, worked out in his favor. Now he's sitting there with his um, longtime teammate, often playing limited events together, Ben Stark and Yuza. They got a pretty good constructive player on their team this time. One of my favorite deck builders, Josh Atalayton. Players are, of course, consulting sideboards now. And this is a, another part where a teammate might be able to point something out and say, ooh, ooh, don't forget to bring that one in. It's actually really good against blank. But I, I don't think I'd want to be Ben Stark in this matchup here. It just feels like you're playing against a deck that you don't interact with, you know, super well, that has at least so far been quite consistent and that can clock you in a meaningful way before you actually have the ability to go off at least consistently. Stark's deck is a little more resilient, but one turn slower. Yeah. That's what we've seen, and, and yeah. game one was already a miracle. Now, at the same time, I don't think Nargu has shown the absolute top of what his deck is capable of doing. We, c we could be seeing discard two Venge Mines on turn one and get them back. Mm -hmm. That's eight hasty damage. And I, I didn't appreciate the power of Hangerback, Walker, and Walking Ballista in this deck. Especially considering that we've seen five of them cast today, and they all immediately went to the graveyard as a state-based action. That's their only purpose. <laughs> it's That's unbelievable. their only purpose in this deck. Now that I say this, the game will be decided by Walking Ballista. S somebody's going to make a Hangerback and just add counters to it. <laughs> That's right, Jacob. Camera's on you, buddy. All you got to do is beat Ben Stark. How hard can it be? See Hunter sitting behind him, perhaps offering advice when needed. By the way, I like it too. We, you know, we saw in game one, then Ben said, "Hey, look." You can trust me. I'm gonna. I'll show you my win condition. You know, so we can save some time here. And uh, and Jacob said, "Cool, I trust you." And he did. 
But then it's a two-way street with him as well, because if you noticed when uh, the insolent neonate hit the graveyard after having discarded the bridge from below, Jacob said, it does trigger, I'm going to get a zombie. And even though Ben wasn't 100% sure about the interaction, he said, I, I trust you, you've been playing this deck, you got a zombie. And there was no, that was it, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, um, a fact that a lot of people don't realize or appreciate is that it's not that the higher you get in the level of competition, the more cutthroat it becomes. There's right. actually this point at the Pro Tour where there is this mutual respect between players and Absolutely. Uh, something something that is uh, has been true for many years. Now, I do, I do want to emphasize here, though, that if you find yourself at a tournament and you're unclear, there is absolutely no shame in saying, Judge, can you just explain to me how this works? D don't, you know, Ben knows Jacob enough to know that he can just skip that step here. But Ben's also a professional, and he knows Jacob. If you don't know the player, just say, hey, I just want the judge to tell me how this works just so I can be sure. There's no shame in that. E even if you know the player, if you just want to make sure. Yeah. And okay. here we go. <laughs> right back to the races again. Insolent Neonate discards Vengevine, and then we see once again Walking Ballista. No counters needed. And that brings back a Vengevine, which has haste, and attacks for four on turn number one. Iker Wellspring, as Ben Stark tries to set up for the turn four kill, he's going to need to find himself a copy of Clark Clan Ironworks, which he has done, Simon. That was... Uh, that was Martin Yuza, by the way, saying, look, I've been testing standard. I have not paid attention to modern over the last two weeks. And yeah, with Ben either. <laughs> Refreshing honesty. Yes. I don't even know what that deck does. Yeah. Don't ask me. Yeah. You know, Ben is not pulling any punches with that, by the way. He was saying, Martin, cool. I like it that, you, that you're figuring out something with that deck, but I'm focused on my, they, he called it a goldfish deck, which is a... Um, An intricate goldfish deck. He did call it that, yeah. Th that's a slang term for a deck that doesn't care what the opponent's doing. It's just, I'm doing what I'm doing, and I'm going to focus on that. Mm. And I actually like, like that mental shortcut, because in the end, it is a pure race that yep. we are watching That's here. right. So... Yes, you might figure out something about your opponent's deck, but in the end, it's just about how quickly can they kill me. So I think what, what you have to do is you have to do the math of what happens if there is a bushwhacker. Yep. Here's another Iker Wellspring. Also a land off the top here for Stark, though he passes the turn back. How about huh. 12 damage? Can he survive Four, this five, turn? Six, That's seven. the question. 10. I think a Bushwrecker is 12. I thought that he had drawn an Ancient Stirrings. Oh, he has Nature's Claim. So Ben can actually gain four life by killing his own Wellspring here at instant speed and maybe buy himself a whole additional turn. And then, how do you go off? With, a, know, with a single Wellspring? Oh, with play? just Wellspring, right. But you need a Mox. I think, I think this... He does have a sphere and a terrarian. Okay. Oh, did you hear that? Hunter Cochran just said, does he have the destroy artifact gain for life? Who has the read now? Yeah. Take that, Martin Yuza. Oh, that's, that's what you got to think about. Yes, there's your teammate. Now, I don't know if it actually changes the plays here, but being aware of that is certainly relevant. That's three more damage, though. Uh, I think that that's actually sufficient. So Ingitschur adds a 3-3 to the battlefield, but as long as there's a Goblin Bushwhacker in hand, which there is... Ingitschur added a 2-2 to the battlefield, but that's a 3-2 right. attacker when the Bushwhacker comes That's what out. I meant, yeah. Three more power hits the battlefield. Is this enough? If my math is correct, the one damage from three, six, Maya Coast killed Stark here. And that is plenty enough. And Ben says, well, what I've got there anyway looks at a forest on the top of his library, but it was Jacob Nagro defeating Ben Stark after losing the first game and winning his match, which means 
is this comeback actually happening for our underdog team? Because they were down huge. They were down four games to zero at the start of this round. And now all of a sudden, there's a single deciding game to decide who's going to win it. Wow. It's going to be Legacy. It's going to be Josh Utter Layton and Jonathan Sakinik. And this is going to decide who wins the round and who stays undefeated. I cannot wait to watch this. We see that Josh Utter Layton is on the play. And that's, that's a huge deal. Big deal, right? On the play, threat already resolved with Days as backup. Uh, I already saw an internet explosive. That's just a backup for something like these uh, pesky Bitter Blossom tokens. So, other late into a, off to a good start, low land count, but this is actually great about Delvog Secrets. If it doesn't hit an instant or sorcery, it often hits a land. And that's exactly what happened here. A second copy of Watery Grave in the hand for Josh, which means he's not attacking for three, which I'm sure he would have preferred. But as you said, now he's got his second land online. He does have days. He also has Stubborn Denial. And he's well, going to play that untapped for multiple reasons. Yeah, the I don't think that Death Shadow is the main reason here. Mm -hmm. the, the main reason is really to also pr uh, prevent Sukhanik from ever thinking about um, spell piercing or dazing something. Right. This also lets Josh or Layton cast Daze for full price and then also cast Daze at a discount. Or he can cast Daze at a discount and play Stubborn Denial. Or if there's a particular set of circumstances, do it all. We, we, the funny thing is, uh, with the hand that Utter Layton has, returning a land to his hand has, is no cost at all. Mm. Because even if he draws a land, he wouldn't be doing anything with three mana. So th there's really no, no downside to using Daze's alternate casting cost, which is actually the mostly used casting cost. Right. If, the, if there wasn't a book on how to play Gush already, I would, I would write it. <laughs> would you have like a subsection on... Uh, on days. On days, yeah. So that was Stubborn Denial. Just pay for it, right? The good old-fashioned way to stop Jonathan from resolving a brainstorm. So Josh very much looking to maintain the advantage that he's got on board with this Delver of Secrets. He's hoping that it's going to transform soon as well. Jonathan double checking with Josh about how many cards in hand it's four. And you could Pass. you could argue you could argue that Josh has a few too many counters in his hand, especially ones that force Sukenik to pay one X one more. So just using them aggressively on a on a card as powerful as Brainstorm is a is a good strategy here. It's maybe not what you want because you can also win the, the drawn out long game, but you're getting good value of your spells. Here comes a ponder now from Josh, which was a great one to transform the uh, Insectal Aberration with. But he didn't see anything he liked there. Immediately puts them back on top and starts shuffling in that classic Josh utter Layton fashion. It looked like three lands, which is yeah. super unlikely in such a low land count deck. Once again, Jonathan just double checking with Josh to make sure they're on the same page. And that's the draw off of Ponder with Josh at 16 life. Or will you? He will. He says, end of turn, I'll brainstorm. And Josh says, you got it. Once again, Jonathan, hyper aware of days. We have seen him consistently make sure that he has the ability to play around it. Yeah. If you want to be super aggressive here, you can actually daze the brainstorm to force the fetch land. Mm -hmm. But that is, of course, card disadvantage. Yeah. But that does make the brainstorm worse as well, right? It's, it's all situation dependent. In yeah. Legacy, you cannot have these hard and fast rules. Always cast your brainstorm at this point. Uh, because... Oh. It's so much different when there is a Delve yeah, on the other side screw, as opposed to just board parity. And whether or not your opponent has already cast a Daze or not. 
Josh has a card that we don't see that often, but pretty powerful. He's got a snuff out in his hand as well, which is another way that he can fight the low mana fight and still keep a, a threat off the board here for Sukenic potentially. Can also be a really surprising pump effect on your death shadow. Mm, that's a big swing too. Can these guys cr finish this comeback against the trio of Hall of Famers? I, I honestly thought this thing was in the books, that they just got rushed early before we even blinked. Yuza won his match. Yep. The other two had won their first game. And it's just like, well, they're 15% from here or something. And then it was win, win, win. Now they're even on matches. And all of a sudden, it's a game three that decides the whole thing. And we really saw how, how favored the Vengefine deck is against the oh, Ironworks combo. It's disgusting. Even dropping game one uh, didn't, and didn't really matter that much. Yeah. Jonathan, with a little pump fake there, taps his uh, Volcanic, has a card in mind, and then decides, mm, let me think about it, actually. Ponder? He's going to ponder. Holding Diabolic Edict, uh, not, not responding immediately to the threat. Patience is, seems to be a large part of Jonathan Sukenik's game. We've seen that time and time again. Well, I, I've, I've said it before, a super impressive performance yeah. by him, by his whole team. Being in this posi position, 6-0, to fight for the 7-0 against this, uh, this super team. It's just, it's just incredible. I've been loving watching Jonathan play, too. It's just been a pleasure as he's maneuvered his way through these matches. This match as well has been super fun to watch. It, I also get the feeling it's not the first time that he's playing Legacy. You know <laughs> you what I mean? You got that vibe? Yeah. <laughs> I also got that. I don't think we have a, a draft specialist who just happened to pick up some uh, underground seas <laughs> here. Uh, by the way, Gurmog Angler now for Jonathan. So he now has the biggest threat on the battlefield, but Josh Hutter Layton still with the Insectile Aberration, can still pri apply pressure with the clock, and maybe even can find an answer. And it looks like John, or excuse me, Josh is actually going to go for the double days here, picking up both lands to keep that Gurmog Angler off the battlefield. Whatever it takes to win the race. That was a big setback for Jonathan as he had put quite a bit of effort into that sequence. Now he did get a two for one out of it and set back Josh's mana development significantly, but he has no pressure on the battlefield and he's still taking three in the air from Josh who is very much on this kind of protect the queen strategy where he's like, I've got this threat. I'm just gonna keep it alive. And there's reanimate for Josh Utter Layton on the Gurmog Angler. Wow, that's a juicy seven points that's of life. half his life total just disappearing but look at this he's got nearly lethal now and all of a sudden jonathan really needs some action Ooh, how about a true name nemesis yeah true name nemesis. This, this is this is the definition of a of a tempo game playing out right yes it's not about card advantage it's not about your land drops it's just about threats and who can close out the game uh quicker than than the opponent now true God. name nemesis this this is the edict that's coming maybe a turn too late now True Name Nemesis is not there to help. But but if he can stick True Name Nemesis next turn, it does answer the Gurmog Angler indefinitely. But it was still correct not to sacrifice it because yes. you, you need to keep your two-turn clock on the battlefield. Of Absolutely. Course. And True Name yeah, Nemesis... We're talking about double the time, right? It was a four-turn clock versus a two. Oh, yeah. It wasn't, wasn't, even, yeah. wasn't even a three-turn clock. That's right. And it would have gone into Sukunik's graveyard, which could could also be beneficial for him. That's not not the main uh, argument, of course. But Trinian Nemesis is it might be too late because Adelaide gets to untap, gets another land drop, might have uh, counter magic once again. Ooh, he just found another diabolic edict off of that shuffle. This is a worthy now, worthy round seven. There's a daze. That's not going to get the job done against the Edict, though. And Sukunik has to Edict. 
that's what I was talking about. You cannot expect your two name nemesis to resolve, even though there have been a bunch of dazes already. It's, it's just too risky, I think. But if you can successfully diabolic edict this second thread by Atrelayton. Oh, there's Death the Shadow. Field. Yeah, it looks like he's got a few more cards in hand than we're seeing there. And Death suddenly, Shadow, suddenly the edict is not enough. Yeah, and Death Shadow is huge, also enough to be lethal. Here's the edict. Is this just simply too late? It says here you can have your fish back. Well, it's a blocker. <laughs> it's a chump blocker. Does it? It can get dazed. It can get. But what if he can snuffed out? Oh, he can just do that now. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that should just be the game if if Josh goes for it because I don't think that uh, Sukenik has any way to interact for free at this point. His hand is Brainstorm, Flusterstorm, Spell Pierce. And there it is, Snuff Out on the Delver of Secrets, clearing the way. And that's going to do it. Josh utter Layton finishes off Jonathan Sukenik, and they are undefeated here in a real nail-biter to end game day number one, round number seven. And look at these guys. He said, good luck to you tomorrow, but we're the ones who are 7-0. and And they're going to move forward with that perfect record for their team great stuff Whew, that was close and you know they were feeling that too right because that just started off way too good it was way too easy at the beginning when how are you guys doing i i won my match i'm up a game cool i'm up a game and you're thinking like we got it what do we want to have for dinner you no, know no, no. 30 the, minute the reservation easy, the easy victories maybe round one but not mm. even at this event, not even round one. Yeah, and certainly that was not an easy one. This round, as we saw, the full comeback this close. I, that was this close to coming off the rails there for that team from Channel Fireball. But they didn't. Josh Utter Layton was able to capitalize and secure the victory. And they're 7-0. and What a great position to be in to make a run for the top four tomorrow. That's going to wrap it here for our coverage of the uh, Swiss portion here on day number one. But I want to remind you, we still got Silver Showcase coming up a bit later for now. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back after this. See you then. The game I fell in love with, I want people to experience in many different possible ways. And one of the things that I, I want to see is it expressed itself in, in a, a modern sensibility, in the way that people are playing now. And that part of that is going digital. Like, I love tabletop, and we'll continue to make a tabletop game, but we really want to bring out the best experience, the magic experience, the, the electrifying thing that made me fall in love with the game. We want to have people play that in a digital form.
Hi there. Welcome back to the news desk. What an exciting day. Maria, Rich, and Paul hanging out with you here. We definitely saw some cool stuff. Results now for you from the team series, which we are watching very closely. Team Ultimate Guard in first place coming into this Pro Tour. Two, uh, their two teams ended the day at 4-3. and three. Cuneo Finkel Rietzel 4-3. and three. Peach Gardenoth 4-3. and three. BDM is now on the floor to get some thoughts from another player in the tournament, Shaheen Sarani. Thanks, Maria. I'm here with Shaheen, Shaheen Sarani. You guys are six and one at the end of day one. Tell me a little bit about who you played with here and uh, how you guys divided up the workload. Uh, well, Ely Cassis and Noah Walker, my teammates, Ely being on Modern, uh, being he top eight a Grand Prix not too long ago with uh, KCI, and then Noah is notoriously good at Legacy. So it kind of stranded me in Standard Land, and uh, you know, Standard's always been my favorite format. I've uh, even on its lows, I've always been an advocate of it, and and this tournament especially, it's the very end of a cycle, and Gear Hulk has just gotten to a point where I think it's a very good card, and I. I'm very comfortable playing uh, the list I'm playing because of that. And you're playing an Esper control deck is what you said? Yeah, you know, I decided this is a tournament to break out, you know? <laughs> Try something new. <laughs> you know, play, you know, Gear Hulks and Teferis and Contempts and all that. I still think, like, you know, if you look at how good Teferi is in the format, it's played in Modern. It's played in Legacy even a little bit. That shows you how good the card is in Standard, and I just cannot imagine playing a deck without it right now. So I got to ask you something. I know when we get to the end of a season, uh, often this is where the players at the Pro Tour are trying to, you know, get their to-do list done. What's on the to-do list for your team here? What What are you guys trying to get to this weekend? Aside from obviously the the big goal of winning a Pro Tour. Our goal is actually we walked in today, and the goal was nothing lower than a top four, and we were very confident played a lot of matches with our individual decks. Uh, I think KCI is by far leaps and bounds the best deck in modern. Uh, I think that Noah playing any brainstorm deck can easily you know, beat the competition with the amount of reps he gets in. Um, and his decks, I think, is fantastic as well. And you know, if 40% of the field is black-red, that's the best matchup for Esper Control. And I've been playing black-red almost every other round. So uh, I got the list from Oliver uh, 2, because I want to see. I was on Grixis. Uh, added a chromium for my crutch so I can beat <laughs> so Training went, wheels, you called it? Training wheels, and I played against Oliver, played chromium, and then the matches finished quickly. He was at six with my chromium out, and so I guess technically I didn't beat him. Yeah, I beat him. <laughs> so that's the goal. Top four, and uh, okay, we're all gold, uh, Noah, myself, and Ely, so a top four is really the only thing that really helps us. And, you know, I think it's about time for, I think we're, we're decent enough where I think a top four is in the cards. All right. Well, we'll see what the cards hold for you guys tomorrow. Go get some dinner. Good luck, and we'll see you tomorrow. Shaheen Sarani. That is a player who is loving day one here <laughs> at the Pro Tour. Fantastic stuff. Paul, what's going on um, with former teammates of yours, Channel Fireball, uh, the squad of six divided into three? Very different fortunes. Yeah, we, we have uh, some, some bad news for some members of the team, some good news, but... Uh, so Team Channel Fireball, we have, of course, the squad of Luis Scott Vargas, Mike Sigrist, and Paulo Vitor. Rough tournament, three and four on the day. But keep in mind, uh, all teams can play into the next day, so they can still rack up some wins for the following day. But for the other half of that team, we just saw them go undefeated. Josh Hunter Layton, Martin Yuza, and Ben Stark are currently 7-0. and And what that means is that if they make the top four and win the entire tournament, they will pick up 60 pro points for their team, which might put them in pretty good position to get maybe that second place uh, behind uh, uh, team uh, of oh, Ultimate Guard. Ultimate Guard, yeah. right? <laughs> right, and we could be in a situation where, again, a big run tomorrow from LSV, PV, and Sigurds, who can't now win this pro tour. Right. 10 and four wouldn't be enough. But if they can get to nine and five, or 10 and 4, those are extra pro points that could make all the difference. Meanwhile, back on the floor, Brian David Marshall, who you got? Thanks, Rich. I'm here with Pro Tour Hall of Famer Eric Froelich. Eric, you guys went uh, 6 and 1 today. Uh, tell me a little bit about how your whole team fared overall and where you're looking to be in this team series. Uh, our whole team did pretty well. I, I didn't actually get to catch the, the final result for uh, the Corey Burkhart, Ben Rubin, Rich Owen team, but they were 4 and 2 going to the round, which is great. We went 6 and 1. We weren't doing too hot going to the team series, but I mean, we were in the top 16, so you put on a run and you see what happens. That's all you can do is, is you buckle up and <laughs> go along for the ride and hope that everything works out. Hope that it ends up with maybe both teams in the finals and <laughs> you max out on points or something like that. Right, then we wouldn't miss the finals of the team series by that much. <laughs> so, yeah, no, we'll see what happens. I mean, uh, I don't know exactly how the standings shape up. It, 
it's really not relevant for this tournament. Like, of course, it's very cool, and we would love to make it to the finals of the Team Series, but we're trying to win the Pro Tour right now, so, like, we're, we're not going to stop. I promise you that. We're going to keep trying our best to win as many matches as we can, no matter what the standings look like. How did, now, how did you guys divide up the workload here in terms of Modern Standard and Legacy? Uh, who, who ended up in uh, what seat? So we thought that Dave was going to be on Legacy. He's very big into Leovold decks. Death Right Charming getting banned changed that. So he was off it. He moved into Standard. Uh, Nassif streams Modern like 26 hours a day approximately. So uh, he plays all the Modern. I'm kind of off that. So I moved into Legacy. Um, I think our Standard deck is pretty broken with this, this Turbo Fog deck. So Dave's playing that. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm playing the broken stuff. You're playing. You're, you're, so you're playing with the dual lands and all and all the uh, all the fancy cards. Yes, all the lands that produce two mana. Yes. <laughs> so the none dual, of the dual lands. <laughs> well, a different form of dual. <laughs> yes, lands. Yeah, soul lands. I guess they get called now. But uh, yeah, no no fancy dual lands. But I do have Winter Factory, so that's cool. Oh yeah, I, I appreciate that. I definitely appreciate a Winter Factory. Uh, what was it like watching the uh, Dave Williams, your teammate, uh, drafting some of these beta cards that take you back to the old days of Limited? Uh, you know exactly what it was like. I mean, you were in the booth the whole time. Um, it, the best part, of, of course, I'm sitting like next to Reed Duke watching the draft, and of course, a lot of cool cards. Reed's favorite card, by the way, of all time, Demonic Hordes. My favorite card of all time, Shiv and Dragon. With two packs to go, they went Demonic Hordes, Shiv and Dragon. The last two packs, so that was pretty sweet. I mean, see, anytime I see Shiv and Dragon get open, I mean, I'm like, well, how can I get my hands on it? But be of all, that's cool. Yeah, that was that was definitely the fish hook for me when I was oh. first opening Magic packs. that got me to stick around. All right, you don't have to stick around any longer. I'll let you go get with your team uh, and we will see you tomorrow these guys are six and one we'll find out how Corey did and give you an update from the news desk okay thank you so much uh, talking of six and one great story guys uh, Romolo Disconsi Gregor Baldin and Olivio Pereira must admit hadn't heard of any of them until about an hour ago they kept on winning and I kept seeing them on the leaderboard thinking I must find out who they are and then I kept thinking ah oh, they'll probably lose the next round no they're six and one the three Brazilians they went to GP um, Santiago in Chile didn't do great in the main event came back on Sunday won the PTQ now Disconsi has played at three Pro Tours Balden and Pereira though this is their first time Balden mind you his three Grand Prix starts they're all in limited which means that today, in round one, was his first ever premier round of Constructed Magic. <laughs> and he the... ends day one at six and one in fourth place in this, which is just phenomenal. Right. Great stuff by them. Tons of great stories all up and down the leaderboard, but that leaderboard is here in our hot, sticky hands, and that means it must be time for end step.